Welcome to our wrap-up session for this year's MIPM. It's a pleasure to see you here in the room this morning, waking up after a busy Thursday night. The objective of the session is to give you a flavor of um, how, on the one hand, major firm thinks about what's happening in the world. And this is why I'm joined here on stage with Mark Roberts, with the head of uh, global research at Reef, based in New York, and also the chairman of NEC Reef and combine his insight and the insight from his team and his research with your insight, you the MIPM participants that we gathered here during the show with the students from the Wisconsin School of Business. We attended the lectures, we attended the summits, and then we questioned you as you were walking around um, yesterday. And so we are going to start with Mark, sharing with us his insights from his research team. Perfect. Thank you, Francois, and it's a, it's a Privileged to be able to share some of our views of what's happening around the globe. Uh, I, let me just sum up with, with our view. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how uh, prices have risen too quickly or initial yields or cap rates have fallen too far. And when we look around the globe, our view is that uh, real estate still looks very attractive relative to stocks and bonds. Uh, it has higher initial yields relative to uh, equities, or excuse me, relative to bonds and, and lower volatility relative to the stock market. And part of that's driven just by where uh, initial yield spreads are relative to sovereign spreads, as well as uh, where capital values have, uh, are. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but just briefly, uh, I won't go through each of the points on the slide here, uh, but just briefly to sort of summarize our view on each region around the globe. Uh, within the U.S., we've obviously seen a turn in the fundamentals. Uh, uh, employment growth has increased. Tenant demand is also increasing. And we're hitting a stage of the cycle where really the pro-cyclical sectors do better, those that, are, that really participate in the recovery, namely office and industrial, uh, whereas uh, it, retail and apartments will, should continue to do well, uh, but we believe that office and industrial are likely to outperform those. Uh, looking at, at the Asia-Pacific region, uh, as I'll sp you know, speak about in a moment, a lot's been said about uh, debt levels relative to GDP. Uh, within Asia, obviously, they went through the Asian currency crisis, and as a result of that, balance sheets, uh, government and corporate and household balance sheets are much healthier there. Uh, so there's uh, considerably more demand for uh, real estate and potential there, and, and uh, those economies have enough fiscal and monetary capacity to really support growth. Uh, turning to Europe, I don't need to tell everybody in this audience, you know, just the challenges that have been brought about with austerity and, and the debt issues. Uh, at the same time, uh, vacancy rates are, are lower than what you see in the U.S. Uh, lease terms are longer. Uh, there's more stability with initial yields. So there's some uh, relative attractiveness in Europe that I'll discuss. Uh, just on a high, very high level, these are, uh, represent our forecast for each region. Uh, the blue bars show what our total return forecasts are for each region. The green bars on this slide highlight what the excess return is, and that's simply our, our, our forecast of total returns over the next five years minus local government bond yields or local sovereign yields. And I think the, um, the important point here when you look at some of those green bars, whether you're looking at the United States or Europe or Asia Pacific, uh, in many cases, the excess returns are as much as two times greater than their long-term average. Now, part of that, obviously, is due to uh, where sovereign yields are and how interest rates have come down. But relative to the bond market, uh, I believe real estate offers a very attractive total return. Uh, when you look at the nature of the total return in each region, it is markedly different. Uh, when you look at Asia, the initial yields are considerably lower than what you uh, see in generally in the U.S. And, uh, on par to slightly lower than what's happening in Europe, and much more of that total return is made up of growth. Vacancy rates are low, uh, the, uh, and there's still some pretty significant rent growth opportunities. In the U.S., it's a little bit more, uh, total returns are driven a little bit more by income than by growth. Uh, we're just at the point in the cycle right now where in the commercial sectors, uh, rent growth is starting to pick up. Uh, in Europe, in the short run, most of that total return is coming through income. Uh, we don't expect a considerable amount of uh, rent growth, with the exception of sort of the Nordics and some other core markets. Uh, but as, as we move out past the, the, the few years, first few years of this uh, forecast period, we see higher growth there. 
And so, Mark, be between the U.S. and Europe, do you have a view on when growth perspectives? Maybe the U.S. looking better? The U.S. is, is looking better, uh, and maybe for the wrong reasons. Uh, the, uh, well, and the right reasons. Uh, as we all know, the least structure in Europe is longer. Uh, so, so in some ways, that not only does that dampen the downside on rents, it also can minimize the upside in terms of rent growth. Uh, lease terms certainly are shorter in the U.S., uh, and one of the reasons it's going to drive rent growth in the U.S. is, is or excuse me, I should say NOI growth, mm -hmm. is not only the combination of higher rent growth, but also declining uh, vacancy rates. Uh, a lot has been said about how values have risen too quickly. And I really wanted to get into this a little bit deeper and using some IPD data, uh, went across and, and looked at various markets to, to identify where values are relative to their peak. So on this slide, you, you might look at the blue bars, and that's how much values fell from the, from the peak of the market cycle to the trough uh, during the credit crisis. So in the case of the UK, values fell 34% from their peak. Uh, since that time, uh, values have increased 10%, yet they still remain about 28% below their peak values. Now, some would argue that the peak values were unsustainable. Uh, we've done some work to really look at what maybe intrinsic values are, so sort of taking a trend line going back to the late 90s and, and growing them at a, at a, a more normalized rate. Uh, and you still see in markets like the UK and US and other places where values, by our estimates, are still roughly about 10 to 12 percent below what we would perceive as intrinsic value. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know, it's pretty consistent across the globe where, where values are well below peak levels, uh, with the exception of Canada. Uh, Canada didn't really go through uh, the cyclical volatility that we saw in other markets. Uh, and indeed, now values are past their peak just because of what's happening with the commodity markets and what's driving demand in Canada. Another key point on why we think real estate offers attractive relative value today is, is this slide, which shows the, the sort of the hollow bars there are initial yields, and the dark blue bars are um, the local sovereign yields. And this data comes from real capital analytics. Uh, these reflect really average primary uh, uh, average yields, uh, but you can see on here that the United States has a, a yield spread of about 500, a little over 550 basis points. Uh, for all of these, if you looked at uh, really prime assets, you'd probably have to shave about 100 basis points off of some of these. Uh, so for example, if you look at the NACREF index in the U.S. today, those initial yield spreads are, are at 400 basis points. And if you go back in time and look at what has happened uh, during those, after those periods when initial yield spreads were at 400 basis points, and ask yourself what were returns over the next three to five years. Uh, total returns, whether it's the US or the UK or other markets, total returns following such periods of high spreads have usually equaled or exceeded their long-term average. Uh, so in the case of uh, the US or the UK, that suggests to us that total returns over the next three to five years are going to be anywhere from three to five, per, or excuse me, eight to eight to ten percent. And, and this is the whole real estate space, right? Because for, mm -hmm. for core real estate, those spreads will be quite a bit smaller. Yes. Right? Yeah. That's, uh, and, and again, that's, uh -huh. uh, I think for prime space, uh -huh. uh, you'd really have to uh, take about 100 basis points off okay. of these, uh, maybe 150 in some markets. Mm -hmm. There are some risks that we see in certain markets. Uh, Hong Kong is one where that, uh, that initial yield spread is low. And, you know, indeed, uh, there's the vacancy rates today in the Hong Kong office market are about 3%. Uh, our forecast for rent growth is, ranges anywhere from about 10 to 15% over the next year and averages about 5 or 6% over the five-year period. Uh, at the same time, you know, we're mindful of the fact that uh, the government is sort of recognizing some of the inflation that's occurred in, in the office market. They're opening up, may open up some land for additional <coughs> development. Uh, at the same time, we have to look at the peg to the dollar, to the U.S. dollar, and what may happen with interest rates. So there could be some risk in terms of, uh, as, in, as growth in the U.S. picks up and interest rates rise in the U.S., does, is that going to uh, create some issues for Hong Kong? Mm 
And in Spain, they just forgot to increase the cap rates when the risk free rate went up. Is that, <laughs> is that what happened? Yeah, you know, we, uh, this, was, uh, this was some information that was put together in February. Now, now we're looking at a point where, where some of those risk free rates or sovereign yields are now in excess of, yeah. of uh, the initial yeah. yield. So maybe that says that real estate is the new sovereign bond. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to also just uh, highlight a, a couple of things in terms of differences around the globe. And again, l using some data from IPD, uh, went ahead and, and plotted out what the risk in return is, uh, return being on that horizontal scale, or excuse me, on the vertical scale, risk being on the horizontal scale. And these are just showing nominal returns. And uh, I, I backed out inflation for each of these uh, markets to really understand you know, are there significant differences in returns when you adjust for inflation in each market? And I found it pretty interesting that the, uh, the real returns for property globally over the last 10 years has ranged anywhere from about uh, 5 to 6.5 or 7 percent, uh, which, was, which was kind of striking that real estate returns are not that different uh, globally. Uh, so it does speak to, the, to sort of the global capital markets that we have. Uh, nevertheless, when you look at some of the differences, uh, you do see the volatility of returns much lower in Europe. I'll talk about that in a second. And certainly when you sort of turn to the U.S. and the U.K., much higher volatility of returns. But, but this, in this case over 10 years, it, it really tells us something that connects back to an earlier slide of view that, that U.S. and U.K. had a big peak to trough. Yes. Uh, drop, and that, that increased volatility significantly it really compared does. to some of these other markets that were uh, more stable. I mean, it's, it's striking to see Germany. We talk about safe German yield. Right, but when you look at the total return picture for Germany, they are a bit of an outlier at the bottom left yes. of your yeah. graph. Right. And I, I think part of that is uh, possibly due to the early part of this period when uh -huh. you know, the effects of reunification was still okay. impacting the real estate property markets. Uh, my guess is now that, that uh, obviously your, uh, Germany is very strong, mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, significant levels of productivity, low unemployment rates relative to other parts of Europe. I would expect, you know, and there's, there seems to be enough capital looking for German assets today, it wouldn't surprise me to sort of see some of these total returns increase. Uh, Japan's another interesting one, uh, obviously because of the impact of deflation that's happened there, those real returns are actually higher uh, in Japan. And this goes to your point, Francois, in terms of the cycles. Uh, what I'm showing here is this concept called beta, which is just relative risk uh, to one another. So if you just think about the, the global real estate market and the cycle it goes through, uh, that uh, with the United States having a, a beta of 1.4, it just means that it's more pro-cyclical. So when the global returns are doing well, it's likely that the U.S. will do even better. Uh, when the global returns are down or declining, the U.S. will underperform. Uh, so you, it, it really goes to show we think that that real estate markets may be the same in different mm -hmm. places, but this really highlights how different some of the markets are in terms of their social, economic, mm -hmm. political uh, impacts and, and the constraints or, or, or uh, flexibility that different real estate markets have. So when you look at, at the United States, we all know that there's, uh, there are fewer barriers to new construction, for example, uh, and that can induce some of the volatility. Conversely, when you look at Japan, despite the fact that it typically has only, uh, you know, in, in the office market, three-year lease structures, uh, it's actually a very defensive market uh, in a global basis, so you can get some more stability there. And part of the reason there is how long it takes to assemble land and parcels and so on uh, to do some development there. So I think the, the development there is much more constrained. Uh, you know, but despite what's, what's happened in Europe, this, I think, is just a good reminder that within a global portfolio, uh, investments in real estate in Europe can, can provide some downside protection, believe it or not. So real diversification going to Germany and Italy, right? Yes. Uh, again, that goes back to maybe the German reunification yeah. point, uh, where it's been uncorrelated, if you will, relative uh -huh. to, to global markets. I'll just touch on, uh, you know, dig in a little bit deeper into to some of the uh, different areas and, uh, you know, our view in, in terms of what's happening in the global economy. Relative to, to last year, we do uh, expect global GDP, global GDP to be a bit slower than it was last year. Obviously, the effects of uh, China and its soft landing, 
certainly what's happening in Europe today is leading to slightly lower growth. So uh, our view is uh, for, for uh, the Asia Pacific markets is for GDP to grow in the range of 5 to 6 percent, still the leading area. Uh, Europe, on the other hand, growing at roughly 1 percent. Uh, and then the U.S. and North America really growing at about 2 to 2.5 two percent. And so it's, a, it's the right time to invest in Mongolia. <laughs> Commodity rich area. I had dinner here on Tuesday night with someone who was doing this actually. I never guessed he would be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you know, there's a lot more transparency coming to the world yeah. with some of it. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, another important point was uh, that I've been really questioning is uh, we've we've all seen the headlines about debt, and I wanted to really try and flush out some facts about what's really happening with debt and, and its impact on growth. And I think this is part of what's driving uh, GDP for us. And what I did here was to, using some data from the IMF, uh, really plotted out on, on the vertical scale what the debt to GDP ratios are of each country. And then the size of that circle shows the amount of debt outstanding. And it struck me, why is Europe taking an approach of austerity and paying down debt while the U.S. seems somewhat lax about it? And I was trying to reconcile some of this ambiguity. And it, it you know, so what I did was maybe look at median age, and that's some information that comes from the CIA fact book. Uh, and it was, it was fairly striking to see that perhaps one of the reasons why uh, Europe may be tackling this today is, is just because of <coughs> The, the older age of the population and the need to sort of address some of the debt issues today. Uh, you know, Asia went through its issues back in uh, the late 90s. Uh, the debt balances have gotten under control there. Uh, and as a result, GDP is expected to grow better in some of those markets, notwithstanding obviously what, what's happening in China. So I could see with what's happening in Europe today that there's, there could be a very bright future for Europe. Uh, it's also interesting in aggregate when you, uh, I think sometimes people overlook uh, the amount of debt outstanding. In Europe, it's only, uh, the amount of debt outstanding is only 70% of the amount outstanding in the U.S. Uh, so the debt levels are lower. It is striking to see some of the markets like Spain where, and these are 2010 figures, so they're probably slightly higher today. Uh, but certainly in uh, certain markets that we hear about in the news and so on, those debt to GDP levels are, uh, you know, certainly lower than they are in other parts of the globe. Mm -hmm. So I think the U.S. has a bit of time on its side to address it. Certainly, uh, you know, what came out of uh, the, the congressional agreements last year is that uh, America's or U.S.'s own uh, austerity programs are going to are likely to begin in 2013. So there will be some expiration of, of some tax cuts and things of like that government spending is going to be cut. Uh, so the U.S. has decided to take decidedly more of a uh, focus on growth. And indeed, if, you, uh, if, you just, uh, if the U.S. were just to grow at sort of a normal pace of growth of 2.5% over the next 10 years or so uh, and, and reduce the pace of uh, the expansion of debt, that debt to GDP level will come down to about 80%. And I think what's interesting here, you, you put it the age, but we should also remember that in Europe people retire earlier than in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And actually, if we if we looked at years left to retirement, so retirement age minus median, your graph would actually be even more spread, mm -hmm. right? And and pointing out to some real concerns yeah, uh, there. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm a bit optimistic about Europe, but then again, I'm a real estate person. I think mm -hmm. we're optimistic by nature, uh, but nevertheless, it, I it, to me it doesn't uh, seem as bad as what some of the headlines might suggest. And certainly what the, what the ECB has done is, is a positive move. I won't, these are just some of our forecasts. I've talked a little bit about GDP, but in the interest of time, let me just move on a little bit. Uh, you know, obviously volatility has been, uh, and risk aversion has been uh, prevalent over the last few years. I think what has happened, you know, uh, with, with what in the U.S. in terms of growth picking up a little bit more, uh, certainly the recent moves by the ECB and, and some of the resolution uh, that seems to be happening with, uh, uh, you know, the restructuring of the Greek debt. Uh, and the lower left hand, or in the lower chart, volatility has been reduced considerably. And at the same time, equity prices are starting to rise. Uh, obviously, that's a positive signal for real estate markets in terms of improving consumer and business confidence. And uh, to the extent these trends can continue, 
it should lead to a pretty healthy 2013. Maybe our politicians should look at the correlation between their effect on volatility at the bottom, uh -huh. the latter part of 2011, and their effect on the stock market right. indices. Yes. Right. I think we could plot in some uh, some newspaper headlines yes. here too yeah. and see some of the spikes in volatility. Uh -huh. uh, inflation, just just briefly. Uh, obviously, it's been on on people's mind. Certainly, with what's happened in uh, you know recently in Iran and oil prices have moved up. There still is that political risk out there uh, affecting inflation, but overall, uh, commodity prices seem to be uh, flattening out in terms of their growth. So for us, uh, inflation risk seems somewhat muted. These are forecasts uh, for inflation levels around the globe. Uh, we see them uh, fairly constrained. There is enough excess capacity, whether it's in the labor markets or in manufacturing, uh, house prices in the U.S., which can contribute to inflation as well, don't really see those picking up in a dramatic means anytime soon. So inflation risks for us are low. And as a result, when we look at interest rates, uh, you know, as, as, as the economies around the globe begin to improve over the next two, three, four years, obviously we do see interest rates increasing, uh, you know, to the extent of maybe 100 basis points, depending upon which country. With where initial yields are today, that's not, uh, that's not a significant enough move to really derail uh, the outlook for capital values. Obviously, with spreads being as wide as they are today, there's pl clearly plenty of cushion there for interest rates to rise without it really impairing uh, values at reversion. Transaction activity, uh, clearly we expect it to pick up in the U.S. Uh, the markets are, are recovering. Uh, there's been a lot more activity going on. There's roughly about 200 billion in transaction activity last year. We see that increase into maybe 250 billion or, or 300 billion. Uh, certainly, Asia Pacific, it, it's had a, a few good years there. Sort of the, the, the slowdown in, in the economic growth there means, uh, you know, still elevated, but, uh, you know, stable levels of transaction activity. In Europe, the issue really is one of debt and can you get some leverage? So see, you know, sort of, uh, sort of uh, transaction activities really on pace with where they have been. Now, for many, this seems like they're lower than what they have been, uh, but we wanted to sort of show that long-term average and, and just highlight the fact that transaction activity is kind of getting mm -hmm. back to normal. I think people have maybe been looking at 2007 and seeing, uh, you know, are we going to get back to those levels? But those were those years were aberrations. And do you think maybe today we are still in an economy where people are hesitant to put their assets for sale, and, and that actually, if, if we continue to go towards more optimism, we might see a, suddenly a big bunch of transactions taking place, people real, reallocating their, their portfolios. Do you think there's that pent-up demand for transactions? Uh, yes, yes. When you look at the amount of capital from pension plans and yeah. institutions around the globe, there clearly is demand, and those yield spreads really support it. Mm -hmm. I think at the same time, there's enough risk aversion. Uh -huh. That uh, uh, people, are, you know, investors in particular, want very focused strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the issues of risk management have been increasing. Uh, so, uh, as we work out some of those uh, needs for investors, mm -hmm. uh, I'd, you know, it, it it will keep some balance to the okay. market. In the fundamentals, uh, let me just sort of jump through some of these. Uh, a lot has been made of the apartment market in the U.S. It still will probably have pretty good rent growth over the next couple of years. Uh, this, you can see on the sort of that top line and just looking at the uh, vacancy rates for the apartment market, really see those sort of bottoming out in 2013 and 14. Uh, but there really is a considerable amount of construction activity that's, that's uh, or capital that's being raised to develop apartments right now. So vacancy rates are, are really at, at sort of their peak level. Uh, the only real NOI growth you get is going to be out of rent growth. In contrast, when you look at the industrial office market, uh, investors are going to be, when you look at growth, they're, they're going to have the benefits of, I would say, our three bazookas, really. Uh, not only in increasing rents, but also declining vacancy. And as we get out into the years 2014 and 2015, mm -hmm. uh, that's at a point when rents are really starting to roll up to market. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the... Uh, uh, challenges of the last few years will sort of wash their way out. Uh, those are just, the, that's a lot of detail on the rent growth, but you can probably pick up these, uh, uh, the detail on the slides afterwards, so I won't spend too much time on that. When we look at Europe and look at the growth rates there, 
uh, you know, for us, it's, it's in the short run, it's really shopping centers. Uh -huh. Uh, and, and more particular, uh, you know, it's really when you look across the continent, there's a really divergence, as you know, in terms of retail sales growth with areas like Central and Eastern Europe having fairly decent uh, retail sales growth, whereas in Southern Europe, it's, it's a bit slower in terms of retail sales growth. Uh, but nevertheless, the initial yields are fairly attractive. We do see better growth in, in shopping centers. Uh, logistics at the same time, uh, only marginally better than office. Uh, but we like logistics from, uh, because of the high initial yields it provides. Uh, really for office, we see uh, better growth prospects uh, later on in the forecast period. Uh, in Asia, the growth levels are significantly higher than what we're seeing in other places around the globe. Uh, and what's happening in Asia is really a lot more inter-regional trade that's taking place. China's five-year growth plan is really focused on uh, raising the standard of living for the middle class. I think that's going to create more demand for uh, retail, you know, well-located retail property. There's upgrading of logistics stock that's taking place in the market. Uh, so industrial and retail really uh, represent some strong growth. In the office market, there are certainly some challenges when you look at areas like uh, Singapore, which has a bit of excess supply mm -hmm. in that market. Uh, Tokyo this year will probably uh, retrench a little bit on rents, but the, our view on the forecast there is for vacancy rates to decline from about 9% to about 5% over the, over the course of the next five years. And as that occurs, uh, begin to see much higher levels of rent growth. And I'll just sort of flip through these uh, in closing. Uh, what, I, what I've did on, done on each of these next three slides is really look at the initial yields less the seven bond yields on the vertical axis, and then on the horizontal axis, look at NOI growth. And uh, we didn't highlight any of the particular cities, but in general, what you see in the US today, one of the attractions behind the US is, uh, on a global basis, is the high initial yield spread relative to sovereign yields and some fairly decent growth projections. Uh, when you look at uh, Asia, uh, a slightly higher growth outlook than what you see in the US. And you know, it's, it's pretty rational, but the initial yield spreads are lower because there's higher growth. Uh, in Europe, when you look at some of the, uh, some of the green boxes uh, over the next five years, you know, for fairly normal levels of growth with what uh, Europe's been used to, uh, and, and initial yield spreads that sort of range between what's happening in, in the U.S. and Asia. Kind of the same story in the retail market with uh, initial yield spreads being high uh, in the U.S., uh, certainly lower in Europe, and then much higher growth projections in Asia. And then finally, turning to uh, the industrial market, uh, if you compare some of the slides, uh, the logistics market has much higher initial yields, uh, can provide some stability in terms of income. Uh, and, and as the economy improves, you know, what we're seeing, beginning to see in the U.S., for example, is just the modest amount of employment growth that we've had improvement in household balance sheets, uh, debt levels are back to levels we haven't seen since the 90s for households. So consumption is starting to pick up again and that's feeding through into the logistics market in terms of trade and so on. And, and I think one of the features we've heard from participants that your si slides really highlight is how the US, you do have the high initial yield, but there's also quite a bit of dispersion on rent growth. Mm -hmm. And so in the US there is really scope to have strategies beyond New York into a variety of cities, because it's quite a bit of difference across yeah. U.S. cities on, on your graphs, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could, we could spend some more time answering questions and talking more about that. So I've, I've you mm -hmm. know, really hit things at a 30,000-foot at a 30, or 30,000-meter <laughs> level here, and uh, there are clearly differences mm -hmm. in the U.S. Uh, Memphis, for example, is thought to be a, a great logistics center. It's right in the middle of the U.S. It has, raw, uh, you know, rail waterway, uh, airport access, uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's really away from the ports mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's much greater activity in sort of the Miami ports with trade with Latin America and certainly trade with Asia impacting the Riverside ports. So a lot of, same thing in, in Europe when you look at Hamburg versus mm -hmm. other markets. Great. Well, thank you very Thanks, much, uh, uh, Mark. And, and so now what we want to do is complement Mark's research with, with your views, the views we gathered from all the participants and in all the conferences. And that's going to be the next slide.
Thank you. So, so the, let me remind you a little bit about last year. For those of you who were, were here, um, last year there, there were many themes that were not that different. I think last year there was a bit of comfort from, from understanding that the wall of money was back into real estate. Um, it was very focused on safe yield. And they're very focused on um, what um, real capital analytics called the FAB4, uh, investing in Paris, in London, in New York, and in Washington, D.C. And those were really investment, not taking a bet on the French, the British, or the American economy. They were really taking bets on the global economy because of the global activity in, in those cities for Paris, London, and New York, and then really a bet on the growth of the U.S. federal government in Washington, D.C. Um, last year, we are hearing people moving to Germany for the safe yield, and a lot of complaint about the difficult execution environment and difficulty to find uh, deals. There was one uh, bright spot that we picked up last year was all coming from the greening of real estate, sustainability of real estate, one asset at a time, but also within the city, um, which was great in terms of having urban planners and architects design spaces for us that makes us happier and higher performing in our, in our uh, jobs. Um, at the same time, also bringing up maybe accelerated functional obsolescence uh, for some, some of the assets in, in place. So that's what we heard uh, last year. And, and, and so the first question we ask you this year is, um, how is your business activity this quarter compared to same quarter last year? Um, and for half of, of uh, you, um, it actually is better this year. For um, most of you, it's same or better. Uh, there are very few people who feel worse this year than they did last year, and this is where I should point out that we could only ask the people who showed up um, this year, and maybe if you felt worse this year than last year, maybe you just didn't come. Um, so let, let's keep in mind this uh, sample selection issue in talking with you, the participants, or uh, maybe you could not afford um, to come. Um, so, so let me give you the, the main themes of what we heard from in investors. In particular, this year one of the new events put up by uh, Reed Midem was the RE Invest Summit, a summit of institutional investors who gave us access to their thoughts and their strategies, and then talking to investors on, on the floors. Um, the question from the summit was, do we need a new model, a new paradigm for real estate investment? And why was this question uh, relevant? Uh, first of all, because one thing we've learned from between last year and this year is maybe something about the inability of our uh, politicians uh, to take steps forward. Um, quite a bit of gridlock in the US, uh, quite a bit of gridlock uh, within Europe. Um, we've also heard that, that this, the center of gravity of the world economy may be moving towards the Asia uh, Pacific region. It's a major transition for all of us to wrap our head around when we think about the location of economic activity around, around the globe. Um, we also understand that the stakes are really high, that we still do face some very significant uh, risk. If you were yesterday at the keynote uh, by Joshua Fisher, he reminded us about the whole history that got us to the euro and how the euro disappearing or Greece not solving their problem could really lead down to a path with potentially catastrophic outcomes for the whole European economy. So there are stakes there. I think there are also high stakes in the way the, the public or the governments relate to the private sectors. There are lots of places around the world where we're still discussing major regulation, regulatory changes that could have a significant impact on how we think about real estate investment and how we manage uh, real estate investment. And then, then we are trying to learn from this crisis we went through. Um, and maybe one of the big lessons that we learned is the certain limitation to the financial contracts we get into with one another. I think we have been very focused and done very well in designing contracts that provide the right incentives when returns on assets are positive and when prices keep going up. But we re certainly realized with the crisis that uh, the contracts we were writing with one another um, maybe didn't really take care of all the potential outcomes when things go bad. And we find ourselves in court and in litigations trying to figure out what it is that we really agreed uh, to do and how we're going to, uh, to move forward. And Francois, I think we, we heard a lot on the phrase like-mindedness. Uh -huh. uh, what's your thought? Is that uh, more of a cyclical change so, or is that a structural yeah, change? Yeah, so, so, so let me put it in the context actually of, of the past two years because I think it's very interesting that it's the first time this year I heard this word like-mindedness at, at the MIPM. And I think it really comes first from that, that drive for greater transparency, mm -hmm. right? That people are looking for more data on the economy, more data on, on the, on the assets trying to better understand what they're investing in, 
because we know that some, maybe some investment advisor didn't deliver what we were expecting from them, but maybe we didn't do our due diligence before hiring them. So there's certainly a uh, request for more transparency in terms of what we are getting into and what are the business plan of the various uh, parties involved. I think part of that is because we want more control. Mm -hmm. Certainly are people talking about, if I'm going to invest with you, then I do want to have a controlling stake. Um, but I think this is problematic, actually, mm -hmm. uh, because normally, if you're going to have control, you better have expertise. And part of the way we were organized in the industry was to, de to delegate the expertise to the local partner or to the general partner in a fund. And, and if we are going to move to a world where both sides of the equation build the expertise themselves, sounds like duplication and a waste of resources as far as the invest savers are, are, are concerned. The other thing with control is liability comes with control usually. I'm not sure we are willing to take on that liability. Mm -hmm. And then there's a real issue about implementing um, real control because if, if, I, if really I'm about trusting the general partner as a limited partner and giving them the control, then I just have to do my due diligence on them. Mm -hmm. But if every one of us, limited partners, have some control, then my due diligence should really be about who else is with me in this fund. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we can uh, implement that. And so this is the context where like-mindedness like comes into play because I don't have time to do the due diligence on every co-investor with me, but maybe I can make sure I'm aligned with people who think like me. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's a great idea, but we know that as, I mean, unless we do a JV, and in a, in a JV structure, we, we are, we are co-investors, we are totally aligned, we're going to feel the upside and feel the downside together. Their like-mindedness, I can see how, how this is helpful because we are feeling the returns in the same way. Um, it's still a little bit tricky because we could be like-minded today and then tomorrow I have some change in my own conditions which suddenly put me at odds with you. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, within a JV type framework, and we hear more of those taking place, then the financial contract will preserve that like-mindedness or make it valuable. Mm -hmm. But that's only for the big players. Mm -hmm. I think there's still going to be an industry with a lot of small players who want to aggregate their funds to get local expertise to invest in, uh, in real estate. And so there, what we hear is trust. And, and, and trust, again, is a fantastic word. But then we try to ask participants, what do you actually mean by trust? And I think, first of all, we all mean integrity. Um, and that's about checking track record of people that we operate with, that we will be treated honestly. Mm -hmm. I think there's some dimension of fairness behind trust, that if something goes bad, we'll treat each other fairly. But there's got to be more than that. And, and the way you see it, for example, when a deal goes bad and you hold the equity position, I hold the debt position, right? Um, there could be a point where the value is below the value of the debt and you're really out of the money. Mm -hmm. And as far as the contract is concerned, you are no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. And I should just squeeze you out and keep control of the asset. And we see a number of operators in those positions who don't, who don't squeeze out the equity holder and keep them in the deal. Mm -hmm. And I think that is related to trust. Maybe what it really means is that I need you to continue to run the asset, although I could hire one of those big firms that will do this for me. I actually think that what it really means is that I trust that our relationship will generate positive returns in the future. And the reason I won't squeeze you out is because even though I lose today by letting you, leaving you in the deal, in the future you will come back and bring me positive returns. So even though on the specific deal that went south, we are not aligned, but because we trust one another, what it means is I trust that in the future we will be aligned again on positive mm -hmm. returns and therefore I'll keep you in the deal. And, and I think if I look at what, what we were hearing last year to compare to what we are hearing this year, on my slide is just going down from the top two bullet points. From last year was about transparency and control. And I think this year we heard a lot more about alignment and, and, and trust. And, and, um, I think we can talk about trust today because maybe we're more optimistic that we're going to get back to a world where trusting one another is a good thing because there will be positive returns to share. And, and you know, it was interesting in the private equity panel, some of the things that we hear about what uh, those managers are doing uh -huh. today is making sure that there is uh, more attention and focus on the business plan. Yeah. And our, 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 is your LP or is your GP executing that business plan uh -huh. and creating more transparency on that? I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And, and, and it does ask a question about the structure of our industry. You can see on the one hand the big platforms, where there the trust you have is in the, the brand, the, that big platform. And then on the other hand you have 
very much smaller player where you know that the, the firm is really the person you're talking to. And so it's really about trusting the person. And actually, I wonder what's going to happen to the operator tie in that middle ground, where they are not really a big enough brand that you can build trust in the brand, but they are big enough in terms of people that their people get hired away. And so then, then who are you really trusting? Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting to see how, how this pans out in terms of the, the competition within the, that industry that serves us as intermediary between those of us who want to save and those of us who want to use um, uh, real estate. And so, so if we're trying to reinvent our, ourselves through different ways of interacting with one another, what type of investments are people uh, pursuing? And, and really the, the big words everybody talks about is core or, or core plus. But I think a, a bit bro core means more this year than it did last year. Mm -hmm. um, we hear about maybe what I would call core plus periphery. So in moving from central London to the sub-centers of London, or moving from central London to Birmingham or Manchester, or within the US, you know, rather than investing only in New York, you know, looking at Boston and Chicago and Los Angeles and Houston. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's core and, and the periphery. We, we've talked about how through this crisis, real estate has survived and done, done well as an asset class. Mm -hmm. and, and this year, I wonder whether we got that right when we used to say real estate is an asset class. I think core has really become an asset class in the same way stocks and bonds are an asset class for the big portfolio investors. Why? Because in today's environment, yields are terrible everywhere. If you're chasing yield, you're going to go to real estate. And, and if that's the case, that real estate is now playing this role in the big portfo financial portfolios at, at the you know, at the bottom of the risk return curve with those strong yields. Um, that means that real estate today, that core real estate is really thought about in relationship to the bond market. Mm -hmm. And, and two, two thoughts uh, from this. First, when the bond market, bond yield go up, how is that wall of money going to readjust between core real estate and the bond market? Mm -hmm. And I think there could be a, a new type of volatility in allocation of funds to core real estate coming from this linking of real estate with the financial mm -hmm. uh, market. And then another question is, if I am today in core real estate because of that need for safe yield, and suppose that as a portfolio manager I want to get a bit more risk, so go up on the curve, risk return curve, why would I go to more risk in real estate when I can actually get that more risk in the stock market? Mm -hmm. And so I really wonder to what extent what we're seeing today is a disconnection of real estate into two groups, the core real estate really integrating as part of financial packages or the financial portfolio, and then everything else remaining in the real estate the way we know it, and being part of alternative strategies. Uh, it, it's interesting how, how we've sort of sliced and diced the risk uh -huh. of real estate. Uh, you mentioned core plus, we've had strategies of value added. I know InRev is working on some additional style definitions. To me, I'm wondering if we, if we with real estate, we just don't live in a core and a non-core world. Uh -huh. Uh, to me, those, those strategies in between, uh -huh. uh, you know, I, I wonder if it's really the phrase I'm starting to use is uh, our investors, they want to date risk, but do they want to really marry it? Uh -huh. And when I look at some of the, uh, those value added strategies, mm -hmm. you can look at information from either IPD mm -hmm. and when you slice the data into sort of value added mm -hmm. or from uh, NACREF in the U.S. And you find out really that the, the risk adjuster returns on opportunistic and core are very attractive relative to other. Uh -huh. And on the value added side, so far, you know, we're still in that period of where returns are covering, recovering, uh, but the risk adjuster returns have been very low. So I wonder if investors will as, as begin to assess, uh -huh. you know, do we really live in a, in a core and an opportunistic world with opportunistic having um, uh, perhaps better diversification benefits? Uh -huh to the stock and bond market because it is, it's, it's much more about operating mm -hmm. in a business plan and so on. So uh, you see a, a real separation. So separation between the, the big broad strategy as part of the big financial mm -hmm. portfolio and then the niche player mm -hmm. who's really going to go after this opportunity mm -hmm. still. I think they want to get married, but they want a quick divorce option. <laughs> I think that, that's what they want. Only for the better. And then we'll get out if it gets worse. So, so we did ask uh, participants. Uh, is now the time to invest beyond core safe real estate assets. And I thought we would show you the result of this question last year, because it's, it's exactly the same, with 70% of people saying, yes, it is time. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability to track people from one year to the next, because that's really what we would like to do, is that, did you actually do it? Um, but uh, that's not our technology. Can I ask you on that sure. slide, Francois? Uh, I wasn't here last year. Was last year, was the, was the response here, do you think, more about 
the view that core was getting overpriced and maybe and, and that's why the uh, there was such a high response mm -hmm. and today is there a view that opportunistic investments may be attractive and, and that's why we got a so yes? I, I, I think it's a good question. I think the, um, unfortunately whenever we ask this question we cannot ask people, by the way, how did you hear the word core? <laughs> right? and, and I think maybe the reason it's the same is because from last year to this year that core definition uh, evolved and, and it's less core this year than last year. It's just whatever you need to define it so that is 70%. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And I, I wonder. Uh, we thought the comparison was striking. Yeah, it was. Uh, so the, we've all heard about the, the debt market, the difficulty of acquiring debt. Um, the difference this year from last year is we now know that there are other players, non-banking players, coming into the market to make data, debt available. Um, and, and, and that actually slide is, is striking for a number of conversations we've had with people. Um, whenever you see someone as seeing a threat as a threat, there is another person seeing the threat as an opportunity. And I think this is good for our industry. The more disagreement, the more likely there are to be people transacting, right? And in real estate, we like to do deals. And you can do deals if we all feel the same. So it's better that we don't feel different. And that's a really nice balance, 50-50. We look at the debt market as an opportunity or, or, or as an impediment. Um, obviously, we are living within this context of the uh, euro crisis. And then same, some, some people are really worried about it and it's, it's making them more cautious. Mm -hmm. We say, no, not at all. I mean, actually, it creates opportunities for us to redeploy our capital and, and, and shift capital. So that it's the same theme of very, very split uh, point of views across the community, sometimes split within the same person, actually. We had people asking whether they could they could answer both yes and no uh, on, on these questions. Um, so um, we also participate in, in conversation with uh, cities and regions. As you know, um, the floor are full of, full of people trying to convince all of us to go and invest and develop properties and participate in the growth of their cities. I think it's the first time we heard cities promoting themselves this year as being low risk. So Helsinki uh, was promoting itself as being a low risk uh, city. Uh, Mississauga in uh, uh, Toronto. A uh, suburb was promoting themselves as being very fiscally responsible with uh, low debt. And the story used to be the cities have high growth, and that's why you should come and participate. And so I thought it was interesting, um, given the climate, to promote yourself as being a low-risk city. And that means something about your fiscal responsibility, your social responsibility about how you handle, for example, um, people with different income living next to one another. So if you have a harmonious um, uh, city. And, and, you know, and we had, you know, the, the, the booth at Qatar, for example, was trying to make the point that their development are about respecting the local DNA and staying true to who they are. Mm -hmm. And maybe that was to give us some hints that they were different from some other booth from the same region that we saw in, in, in the past mm -hmm. years. Um, we found the cities there this year, the, the mayors, to be very concerned about how they can generate spillovers. Spillovers that they, they, they can harness. So how can they create more value for the private sector by um, providing great infrastructure? We also heard about these catalyst uh, projects. So for example, in, uh, in uh, Copenhagen, cleaning up a piece of the harbor so you create a beach experience, which then creates spillovers for the neighborhoods um, around there. So maybe smaller projects that, that create wide benefits for the private sectors. Then there's quite a bit of conversation about how city leadership can, can bring on uh, cultural change when working in partnership with the urban planners and the architect. This is about uh, staying ahead of people, giving them incentive to use public transportation or the bikes. And sometimes it's actually trying to keep up with the people. Lots of cultural variety um, within uh, Europe in particular. Um, that shows up in terms of who's going to pay. Who's going to pay for these great new cities that are greener and sustainable? And again, th there are countries where people are quite happy to pay tolls or quite happy. They don't mind paying tolls and, and to enter the cities. For example, in France, paying the toll to enter a city is something we got rid of at the revolution, right? So, so this is not something, it has a different historical baggage than paying a toll to, to get into London. Obviously, every mayor, every elected official worries about the next election. And we know that in most of our countries, election cycles are shorter uh, than the urban planning uh, cycles. And there's something good about that. It means that you better do projects which match with the demands of your people, otherwise you won't get reelected. And if you're not reelected, if what you do matches with the local desires, then it's likely that the next elected official is going to continue what you're doing. Mm -hmm. the, the one complaint that you hear again and again is the difficulty of uh, dynamic leaders at the local level. 
to work within national frameworks. Mm -hmm. and, and France, on that point of view, is not a leading light. Um, so we did ask, um, you know, we had those stories about a few cities promoting themselves as low risk. We asked on a broader basis, you know, what do you consider the, the biggest impediment to investment in your city and region? and um, global economic conditions, competition from other cities. They are very aware that every city around the globe is competing to attract economic activity and to attract uh, people, the fundamentals in that political climate. Um, a lot of it, I think, is in the same in the private sector. It's about the uncertainty of future regulations. Right? The sense in which if we know where we're going, we can price it. It's just if we don't know, that's very difficult uh, to deal with. Um, the competitive advantage that cities try to emphasize at MIPEM to make themselves attractive to investors is um, uh, location, uh, number one, new vision. Um, and then this high-tech base, what kind of industry we have within our city and infrastructure. And growth used to be much higher in the past years. And it's difficult in the current economic environment to argue that the growth story is the main story for, for, for you to represent yourself. Um, so overall, we wanted to know how has MIPM changed uh, people's outlook. And every year, there's always a few grumpy people <laughs> who just come out of here without smiling. And I don't know if it has to do with the food or the drinks. Um, it's the analyst. It's the analyst, OK. <laughs> it's the analyst. Um, but for the most part, people enjoy coming to MIPM. And they live happier than they got here. And you know, it's a rainy weather on the first day. And look at today. It's a beautiful day. No reason to not be more optimistic. Now, I mean, this is cheap talk, right? Are you more optimistic? Yeah, I mean, this is real estate after all. We are a bunch of smiling people. Um, so we did ask a little bit further, you know, what is your perspective on your real estate market compared to the same time last year? And, and it's most good to see it is consistent uh, for the most part, except for the 15% 15 15 that are less optimistic. Most people feel the same, or half of them feel even more optimistic this year. Was the survey taken when it was raining on Tuesday? No, no, it was taken yesterday. It was taken okay. yesterday. No, no, we don't take surveys on rainy days. Okay. Um, <laughs> so no, it was taken yesterday afternoon. Okay. Um, and, and, and really, so you know, we, we are a business school, and uh, we are here with our students. And, and this, again, could be cheap talk about your perspective. Mm -hmm. And really, there's one thing we really care about. And I think you also share the same concern. Is if you're optimistic, are you actually going to hire, right? And so th that's the last question we ask. Is, uh, is your optimism going to translate into actual actions uh, within your company? And so are you planning to hire this year? And it's good news. It's about two-thirds of the people are telling us that yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are sufficiently optimistic that they might bring more staff mm -hmm. uh, within their, their enterprise. Um, so just in, in conclusion, um, if you haven't had time to see it yet, I want to point out to, to, to two headlines this morning on the front page of the Financial Times. Uh, bondholders back Greek bailout. Um, we have had so many positive headlines about Greece <laughs> for the past few months. I don't know if that's going to be one more spike on this volatility index. Uh, today's down, and let's see what tomorrow brings. Uh, maybe it's the last spike. I don't know. But then you know, we, we're talking about transparency and control. And I really liked on, on the header of the FT, there was this other headline about too much information, are regulators overwhelmed? And, and um, I wonder if the, tomorrow the headline will be the companion headline, too much information, are investors uh, overwhelmed? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where we stand. We'll see what next year's MIPM bring. Um, you know, major takeaways uh, for us this year, that the core real estate, you know, that safe yield asset class, that's being thought of the same way you think about bonds and, and stocks within big portfolios. And the city is really understanding their role as, as a supporting, coordinating structure, providing the infrastructure, helping with cultural change so that we can all live in uh, much more sustainable, green, and friendly uh, uh, places. And then I guess the, the anecdotal uh, comment from, from talking with a number of friends here at, at MIPEM, um, the sense that this was a very professional MIPEM. Uh, we have a friend here who has been coming for 21 years and told me this was the first time that nobody canceled the meeting in the 21 years he's come here and that he saw so many more deals this year than he had in, in the recent times. And I think that bodes well for our industry. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time for, for questions. And uh, we have a lady here who is ready to handle microphones. If you want to ask a question, if you don't mind raising your hand. 
and stating who you are. Yeah? Uh, Peter Drake, uh, the new CEO of Oscar, and uh, as you see, I'm a fairly old guy. Uh, I'm coming into the property industry from the information industry and the, finan and the uh, financial industry, so mm -hmm. it's the first time I've been in MIPIM, first time I've seen it. it to me, it, it seems a very fragmented market. Um, um, it's starting to look at globalization, mm -hmm. but um, <clears throat> have you any perspectives as to how, how these national institutions can work more, to work better together in uh, international context? Do you want to take this one? Sure. Well, uh, in part of my role in, in terms of uh, uh, being chairman of the board of NACREF, uh, we have just recently uh, uh, restructured our agreement with our sister organization, the Pension Real Estate Association, and are trying to strengthen uh, real estate information standards. And uh, also working with partners around the globe in terms of IPD and INREV and ANREV in terms of trying to create some of that. Uh, I think we're at the beginnings of some of that. Uh, having covered global real estate markets myself for now about uh, 12 to 13 years, uh, there certainly is a lot more demand for information in trying to link up the various databases. Some, some firms obviously are, are, are moving very quickly on this. And it's encouraging because I think those, when we hear about investors at the investor mm -hmm. summit earlier, uh, one of the things that they talked about is risk management and really what does that mean. And we have a lot of tools and a lot of learning lessons from the equity and bond markets. And so as an industry, we will create more efficient use of capital uh, to have some of those tools available. So I, I think you know, the market can be much different in another five and ten years. Uh, just as you look back uh, five or ten years from today, uh, you know, when you look at the work IPD is doing, mm -hmm. and we now have ten years worth of data on global markets, uh, mm -hmm. on markets globally. And as we build those databases, I think that's going to help investors make better decisions. And I, and I think, you know, then beside IPD, outside Real Capital Analytics and, and CoStar and, and more of those that you see. So IPD gives you the data from the, the macro point of view, and then you have all these source of databases, like one property at a time or one day at a time. And I think a lot of it, thank you for asking the question, is driven by people like you coming from the financial sector into the real estate sector and bringing that expertise and bringing that demand for data that actually is making the private sector rise up to the challenge because there are people like you interact in this market who are asking to handle this market the same way you've handled other markets. And I think this is great for that uh, primarily core type assets where operators like you are going to be uh, present. I think the, 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 the non-core, the opportunistic, that's going to be more uh, the type of hedge fund, private equity fund type of, type of a sector, which is going to rely, mm -hmm. actually take advantage of the lack of data and, and lack of transparency maybe to, to make those big deals one at a time. Yeah. But you, you are the one driving. Uh, question, question in the back, back, please. So there's one at the very far back, and then I'll come back to you in, uh, in the middle. Thank you. Mark, uh, do you think that the increased um, transparency in, in reporting and uh, looking at data will shift the, the beta picture you presented? Do you think it, the differences will become uh, smaller or, or, or bigger? And uh, the differences in in betas in, in, sorry, betas. in, in betas, betas across countries. Uh, that that's uh, that would be. I, I I still think there's an underlying political, social, and economic drivers. Uh, 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 just as Francois was mentioning at the end, how cities are marketing themselves. Uh, you know, c cities have unique advantages. Uh, each one of them can be can be different, and they can be driven by different sectors of the economy, and so. Uh, you know, to the extent that those that cities maintain that competitive advantage in their particular industry, uh, those industries will cycle over time, and uh, those the nature of it. So, if anything, I think it highlights the benefits of of global diversification and greater insights to these things as you build portfolio strategy. You know, which markets are more mm -hmm. cyclical, um, and and can you uh, ex you know implement a strategy there versus those that may be more defensive if, if they see some risk coming. So it's, it hasn't happened in the, uh, with all the information in the equity markets. Uh, the betas can, can still, you know, the, the relative variance can be much different by industry sector. Thank you for the question. 
first of all, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, I represent Russia and Russian company Accent. Uh, I really would like to hear a few words about Russia and your view on it, on its real estate market, and what Russians' uh, role in the global real estate market. Just a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I must say I've you know, only cover Russia from a, from a very high level. We know it's a commodity resource rich area. Certainly there are a number of uh, wonderful developments. So you can walk the booths and, and see all the things going on in the Black Sea and so on. Uh, you know, for, for us, I think that it's a function of uh, representing our clients' interest and making sure that we're implementing good risk management. Uh, so for us, it's you know, those markets that have greater transparency, uh, I think, will benefit. Uh, and, and other, you know, you can see that happening in sort of the CEE countries where there's a lot more coverage taking place. And I know that that's uh, happening in, in Russia as well. I, I look at, uh, you know, you go back 10, 15 years and, for example, the work that a Tishman Spire or Gerald Hines and so on, I think they, they were, those are some of the first sort of international uh, firms to really start some development. So I think the prospects are there and for in order to uh, provide proper advice to our investors, I think the mm -hmm. thing that we're going to be looking for is, is more transparency in terms of the fundamentals and the rents and so on. So that at the Wisconsin School of Business, we track the market sentiment of uh, members of the Association of Foreign Investors in Real Estate, who are pretty much the, the biggest global, global players who are active in uh, U.S. investment uh, from abroad. This is a community which um, four years ago was looking at, <coughs> at investing in Russia. There's quite a bit of interest. Uh, but then shifted its interest more to China, Brazil, and, and India. I think because of transparency issues and, and I think the, what we were picking up in the surveys were uh, safety concerns. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the first year actually where I've heard again about some funds being created <laughs> from abroad to go into Russia. So Heinz, for example, I believe, just raised a fund in uh, Asia to invest in Russia, and from what I hear, it's actually a um, dollar-denominated uh, fund. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's interesting to see that this uh, return of the global community to have a, an interest. Because so far in the past year, it seems to have been a very niche player uh, type of strategy. Um, so let, let's see what next year's bring, actually, between this year and the next, with regard to Russian investment. There's an opportunity to pick up. Yeah, one last question. Um, my name is Mark from the City of Tel, and I'm referring to your slide, Mark, uh, about the debt and demographics, and you were fairly optimistic. Uh, if you added one more aspect, what I would call the pain factor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to it, namely the liabilities that many, many countries, particularly in Scandinavia, but also in Europe, have as far as uh, social, uh, state guaranteed social cost is concerned with the aging, mm -hmm. uh, would you be still that optimistic? Uh, well, I, I, yes. I mean, <laughs> because uh, I think what history has shown, whether it's the Asian currency crisis, that uh, uh, you know, resolving issues is better than rest. Uh, you know, whether it's you know, certainly in China, the whole plan for it is an analogy, is an example, is really raise the standard of living, create more domestic consumption, have less reliance upon necessarily the export growth, export market. So I think there is a continual renewal that we see. So with regards to the Scandinavian markets, uh, you know, I, my, my view is that those, there are some fairly stable markets and uh, uh, some, of the, some of the funds there certainly are looking after those pension plans. Would you have more to add on that question? Right, um I know that in uh, France, for example, the way we report this debt and those liabilities, that uh, I'm not sure we report this right. Yeah. And, and I think this is, this, it's a big issue in terms of how we count mm -hmm. um, what's a hangover. Yeah. And um, I'm just, it'd be nice to see data that we feel is comparable across countries. Yeah. From this point of view, I think there are wide varieties. And I think that's why I found your slide most interesting, and I would, and I would add the retirement age uh, to it. And then if you could add the liabilities, that would be even more brilliant, I think. Yeah. And it, it may require that we have a new generation of sort of economic statistics. You know, the way we measure things are based upon formulas created in the 30s. Mm -hmm. And even when we look at debt to GDP, 
we're looking at an income versus, uh, you know, a, sort of a net income statement measurement versus a balance sheet measurement. You know, if this were real estate, we'd be looking at loan to value rather than maybe income to value. So uh, it does argue that maybe we can, mm -hmm. uh, we'll get that out of the University of Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so last, last question. Oh, I'm from Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and here we've had the worst tsunami in the world, I think, uh, in the United States, I know at least. Uh, we've hit rock bottom, and we've lost 65% of our mm -hmm. assets. And right now, we have a lot of Asian Chinese people coming in mm -hmm. and investing heavily because no one has ever seen our markets this low. Mm -hmm. And what is your take on Las Vegas? And you also said trust. The banks have not been kind to us. Mm -hmm. We've had eight suicides of real mm -hmm. estate people and developers recently this year. I mean, it's been really bad. But our tourism is picking up. Mm -hmm. We're the entertainment capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And right now, we're the best investment deal in the world, I think, mm -hmm. today, because of mm -hmm. our pricing. Mm -hmm. You can't build for what you can buy for. Mm -hmm. Nowhere. Well, there's a reason why they call us part of the dismal science, so I'm not, I'm not sure if I can give you an optimistic answer, but what I would say is that, uh, again, going back to individual cities and what the, the drivers of growth in those cities, there are some cities that have technology and uh, you know, some competitive advantages there where the employment growth levels are now back past their peak, uh, or you know, from their previous peak, so cities like Austin have come back. Uh, cities that have had a higher concentration to leisure and construction, Las Vegas falls into that uh, realm, as does you know, certain parts of Florida and things like that. Those are areas where the employment levels are still well below some of their peak levels. And it, it's going to be some time to sort of repair some of that and get some of that job growth back uh, in some of that construction. I think as you see world economic growth pick up, mm -hmm. more growth in the U.S., it, it'll come back. Um, the opposite side is that homes are very affordable in Las Vegas right now, mm -hmm. as they are in Phoenix. So mm -hmm. cheap. I mean, yeah. you can buy things that are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, and if we had prices of a million mm -hmm. dollars for a high-rise condo, we come down. in the 200s, 300s today. So, and I think at, at the same time, in, in to, to uh, close it there, I think this uh, story points to a certain source of optimism, and I think we saw it here at MIPM, with some Asia investors become more interested in bringing uh, funds to Europe and, and, and to the US, and uh, bringing debt to the other BRICS uh, country, for example, China's announcement uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so, so th there is wealth around the world, and that wealth is chasing real estate, and we're trying to organize ourselves to, to channel that money from the savers to the users of real estate. And um, I think as an industry, we have a bright future ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we will ask you again next year, how do you do compared to how you did this year, and hopefully the picture will be even more uh, rosy. And with this, uh, well, thank you very much for attending our session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, Francois.